Hello, everyone. This is Denny Miller. We're going to be talking about the big race that just happened this past Sunday, the 106th running of the Indianapolis 500 on our Indy 500 yesteryear and today with Speedway Insiders, Paul Page, Bob Gates, and yours truly, Denny Miller. And uh, what a weekend we had. Um, perfect sunshine weather. Can you guys remember when you'd always be wondering what the weather's going to be like or lighting candles in church that wouldn't rain? <laughs> I literally had this person oh, yeah. that, that had, most of her prayers gets answered. <laughs> Well, I, I, or I can please pray that it doesn't rain and everything. And I can remember as a young guy, especially, they talked about Tony Holman weather, uh, where yeah. it seemed like it was always sunny <laughs> on race day. Well, <laughs> At least it was, it was you know, about 1973. It was an absolutely oh. <laughs> gorgeous day. Yeah. But we're going to go back to carb day real quick, like which looked like it was going to get rained out all day. And it eventually dried, and the track opened, much to the chagrin of Colton Hurd, and that's what we want to talk about to begin with. Uh, um, very vicious-looking crash. He gets upside down, destroys the race, his race car. He's gonna. He has to go to the backup car, which he won the, uh, the Grand Prix with, um, and it never did work good in the race, but. Uh, I want both of your guys' comments on the new uh, safety features that IndyCar has put in these race cars, because that very easily could have been a fatal uh, at some period of time in racing history. Bob, what do you think about did you uh, uh, Absolutely. I mean, uh, safety is just, uh, you know, a hallmark of IndyCar racing today. Uh, and I'd say compared to any other series, I uh, watched uh, part of the, uh, carb day, uh, carb day evening on, on Peacock, they did a rerun of it. And what struck me, uh, got my attention was Dale Earnhardt Jr. And he just went on and on and on about how quickly, uh, the safety people got there, got to the accident, as well as the safety of the car itself, how quickly, uh, the people got there. They were moving before, er before her to ever stop. And within, I think they said less than 10 seconds, somebody was on the ground talking to uh, Herta underneath. So it, it's just amazing, really. Paul, without yeah. the without the arrow screen, would he have survived that? Uh, yeah, I, I think he would. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. I hadn't really thought about that one. But the, the arrow screen is, you know, basically designed to keep stuff from getting into the cockpit. And I think that was more the roll bar, the uh, rollover bar that actually uh, helped him there. Plus the fact that the tub is so strong, but when you get a good look at that accident, you realize that uh, there's a lot of upfront damage. And so that's the tub and the nose protecting him. Um, so yeah, and that was <laughs> just a terrible thing to happen. And it was on his last lap. Of, uh, of the carburation. He was coming in the next laps. So, uh, and, and very easily the day could have got rained out. Uh, when we last, oh, yeah. uh, our last episode, uh, we all were kind of penciling after his impressive win in the Grand Prix and his second place qualifying start last year as Colt Hurt as a favorite uh, or pre Reese favorite. And it, it didn't happen at all. Uh, he had a slower than usual qualifying that pushed him clear down uh, toward the back of the field. In fact, all the Andretti cars really did other than Romain Grosjean. Right. And uh, then to have to drive a car that he never raced that worked with, uh, and it didn't work right the whole race. And he was a quickly, uh, he was the first car out of the race on a non-accident uh, in this, uh, this year's race. Well, well he, you know, the, the, the uh, engine wasn't working for him. And that was almost from the get-go, if not the get-go. Um, so he, you know, he just stayed down there in 25th forever. Right. Um, he had a lot of trouble with the, uh, the whole throttle system and everything on that car. And uh, it just, it wasn't his day right from the beginning. But he stayed out there, you know, and 
Uh, you remember in, in the day how uh, many drivers would have just come into pits and stormed it off because it wasn't working? Yeah. Right, right. Without mentioning any names, maybe a nope. computer <laughs> laptop might have got tossed. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the other thing that struck me, uh, and we might get into some of this later, but, um, you know, Colt and Hurdy ended up uh, ha having throttle problems or something. But regardless, he finished in 30th position, but he ran 129 laps. Yeah. I can remember days when if you ran 129 laps, you might finish in the top 10. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, true. that's true. So well, he, he still made he still made a chunk of money. I think it was like uh, 435,000, yeah. something like that. Yeah, that's not uh -huh. bad. No, not <laughs> bad payday. Not a bad payday. And but, one of the other things we talked about was uh, would there be any release by private citizens of balloons during the plane of back home again in Indiana. Did any of you happen to notice any balloons going up? And this yeah. sets up something we're going to talk about in just a second. I don't know if it happened, but uh, the, the Thunderbirds, and Paul, you're a pilot, and I'll let you elaborate on this, right at the conclusion of back home again in Indiana, which would be the typical release of the balloons. <clears throat> these uh, four or these Thunderbirds flew over and then split apart uh, with their trailing uh, exhaust or whatever they call that. And it was as impressive uh, as anything I've seen uh, at the Speedway anyway. Paul, yeah. you're a flyer. Tell us about that well, maneuver. Uh, Is that a common uh, maneuver? Or? Well, well, first of all, let me. Let me answer your first question, because I specifically looked, I'm in the broadcast booth looking west, and I specifically looked above the grandstands to see if any balloons were going to come up over there. And Denny, I'm sorry to report your campaign did not work. <laughs> However, I'm sorry, buddy. I, I did talk to this one church, and they it was too late to do it this year, but they're considering as a fundraiser next year having, uh, you know, biodegradable balloons, of course. Uh, sold uh, for their church and to be able to release by all of the, the people. Now, whether they have a short memory between now and <laughs> next May. Uh, right, right. And I, I don't know. I think that was uh, uh, the crow in Connecticut egging them on uh, type <laughs> of, uh, of a thing. But the Thunderbirds was an impressive replacement for uh, the balloons going up. Uh, I, I've yeah. never seen anything quite like it. It's one thing That's a, to do the flyover, but to do what they did. Well, I've I've had the distinct, distinct honor and privilege of flying both with the Thunderbirds and with the Blue Angels. I have more time with the Blues, but uh, that the one thing that really surprised me was that came from the east. Normally, you just see the down the straightaway uh, pass of whatever they're they're flying over. Uh, the B B two, by the way, being the most impressive thing I've ever seen yeah. uh, as so, a solo aircraft. But um, yeah, that uh, that break apart that they did that was uh, yeah, first of all it was unexpected, and I I couldn't understand. I was uh, in the grandstand, people were standing up and they were pointing, <laughs> and and I'm what are they looking at? Because yeah, it's that's that was coming from behind me because it was coming from the east, and. Boom, they went over the top and then they that's when they did their their break and it was oh that was spectacular. It was and they're they're you know to do that to fly at those speeds and stay that close together for any demonstration team is is just amazing. They did a beautiful, beautiful job. Do you see this as the new norm to conclude back home again in Indiana? Well, uh it would be a, a nice way to do it, yeah. Um whether or not you can get a flight demonstration team every year for it, um, that, that's a little different. But they they would put that in the, if they would put that in the schedule uh, for the demonstration teams, the, the Blues or the Thunderbirds. Yeah, I, I it's not you're never going to replace the balloons because once again, <laughs> as I've said before, I'm a right. traditionalist. <laughs> so right. it'll take me 30 years or so to get over the balloons, <laughs> but I'll do my best. <laughs> and are you as a traditionalist? Uh... Have you gotten over drivers start your engines? Uh, yeah, years ago, years ago. Years ago. Uh, yeah. So, it's, uh, in, in fact, the first one of the first times that happened, 
in that form, driver starts your engines. For some reason, um, some group came to me that was involved in a, in a race car and asked me if I could say, uh, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen, start your engine or something like that. And I said, I have nothing whatsoever to say about <laughs> that. And I, I sent them to the appropriate person. And, and I think they may, that may have been the year they actually started it that way. But yeah. I, it, that's, that's a fine. I, I, I don't have any problem with that at all. Right. Yep. So, Bob, you have behind you what is the winning car. Uh, right. Yeah. Those, uh, I guess, was that a surprise? It wasn't a surprise to me because Marcus Ericsson from Sweden became the second Swedish driver. Kenny Breck had won the 1999 Indy 500. Uh, Erickson was a member of the very strong all month uh, Ganassi team. And basically, it was always in the top 10 every practice session and qualifying session. And he did a good race. And yeah, uh, very good. A beat uh, Pato Award uh, for second place, quite close. And then uh, TK Tony Kanan finished third. Uh, and there was one thing toward the end that I really applaud the Speedway staff for uh, late in the race, lap 195, uh, NASCAR ace Jimmy Johnson uh, crashes and the, red, uh, the yellow flag comes out and then they stop the race. Thus, had that not happened, uh, Erickson would have won under the yellow because it would not have been cleaned up in time. Um, and, but. Well, but actually Erickson did Win under the yellow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> technically he did too. So very yeah, good, Paul. That's right. You're, but, getting, well, you're getting ahead of the story here. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, but, no, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah. The one thing I I wanted to say is the one thing that surprised me, and of course Speedway had done that before, and I fully approve of that. Yep. Except the accident happened, and you knew that that wasn't going to change, and I thought they'd throw the red flag immediately knowing that it, you know, that, that that's not going to clean up. Instead, they waited and ran the, the last three laps, which mm -hmm. is a hint of the NASCAR uh, technique. And yeah. I would have rather, if you have an accident in the last 10 laps, that you flag it red right away. And, but, but then once again, there is nobody in officialdom or race control that listens to me ever. And, that, and, that's, and that's probably really smart on their part. <laughs> oh, we got a segment of this uh, uh this youtube podcast that we're doing that that may change and bob's going to be talking about a certain thing that happened uh that and they may very well listen to you now with some oh, no. behind <laughs> name. not phd but it's something like hof or something i think uh, no but they did stop the race uh, uh potentially uh jimmy johnson the teammate of Ericsson's could have been the goat had uh, a pat of award because there's no way award would have caught uh, Ericsson without a without a going yellow or red. Right. This yeah. for those who were not there, they bring all the cars to the south end of the pits and they're lined up one after the other, and it was down what ten minutes time before it was cleaned up or thereabouts. It did have a. Uh, a crippling effect on Ed Carpenter, his car wouldn't start. And that is always a concern that once they shut those down, they may not restart again. That and Carpenter proved that. Uh, well, we're, as we're looking ahead to the Detroit race this weekend, that happened uh, to Will Power last year. And yes. he ended up losing the race because he was definitely a contender there too. Um, anytime you shut those engines down after they've been running any length of time, yeah, that's a possibility. I, I don't know if, the, if it's the old thing of vapor lock or, or what it is, but it's very definitely a danger when you do that. That thing may not restart. Right. I, I think it's electronics that they're so concerned with about the heat. Yeah. I know Erickson's uh, stra uh, strategist was really upset, and you might have seen that from the booth mm -hmm. all with uh, – Montoya not pulling up so they could get people out there they couldn't get people out there to cool everything until everybody was properly lined up 
And he said, the electronics are just setting your cooking is the way he, he right. described That's it. That's exactly so, right. Exactly yeah. right. Now, as Paul correctly noted, the race did end in their yellow on the last lap. Sage Karam uh, tags the wall and the yellow comes out and, and uh, Erickson wins it. Actually, uh, he would have won it anyway had that yellow come out or not. I'd right. He had, he had them covered. No, uh, actually, the uh, award on the what would have been the white flag lap very briefly took the lead going into one, but brilliantly played by Erickson to have him up on the high side, that he, and he would have gotten in the marbles and probably crashed had he had gone. I was a little surprised with uh, Tony Kanan and his his just tremendous skill on restarts that he. Uh, didn't have a better restart to get at least an award for second. Uh, he got kind of hung up almost side by side with Felix Rosenquist, who did finish fourth. But uh, I think that kind of uh, neutered uh, his his efforts to get him. Uh, well, we've we've seen the outside pass attempted uh, and succeeded with uh, well Michael Andretti and Rick Mears one year where. Michael passed on the outside and Rick came right back and did the same thing to him. Right. So uh, at least it's theoretically possible, with, especially today, I would think with the ground effects uh, and just the whole aero package on the cars. Um, but Pedal Award could have done what uh, Takuma Sato did and crashed <laughs> right. attempting that turn on the final, uh, that, that pass yeah. on the final lap. And so, yeah, it, uh, you just, I think Pat O'Ward did a smart thing. Yeah. Yeah. He, he shows some uh, wisdom for his age at that point. But we, uh, we led with uh, Erickson being the, the lead story, but the real lead story of the race was the Iceman, Scott Dixon, clearly having the race in control. Late race, his last pit stop coming down pit lane. He exceeds the, uh, speed limit uh I, I guess they said by one mile an hour and then he had to do a drive-through penalty and dropped him down to 21st position and he was back in there and it, it cost him the cost him the race uh that's a two, two million dollar mistake right there yeah. two million dollars right yep so we're gonna have a little fun with this uh <laughs> that this goof that dixon did uh, has not been unprecedented and Bob and I have kind of thought of five that uh, may top this and we'll let the audience if they want to respond to this get their opinion of the biggest uh, goof up ever the first one was I we think I was in 1947 and rookie Bill Holland was leading comfortably in the blue crown special his car owner Lou Moore who was a very good race car driver himself didn't want his two cars battling out, perhaps crashing. So he holds up, writes easy and displays it to both Bill Holland and Maury Rose. Now Rose was the co-winner in 1941 before the war after taking over Floyd Davis's car. So Rose didn't pay any attention to the slow down sign, the easy sign. He passes Holland. Holland waves at him as if, uh, you know, he thought he was a lap ahead. And then um, Rose goes on to win his his second 500. Uh, Holland was just livid on that. And then they calm him <laughs> down saying, you're not going to get a better ride than a blue, blue crown ride. But uh, that's goof number one. Goof number two, I particularly, because I wrote about it uh, in uh, Eddie Sachs, The Clown Prince of Racing, with three laps to go, Sachs ducks into the pits to change a tire, allowing A.J. Foyt to uh, go on to win his first win. Now, for you Foyt lovers, I will admit, Foyt had to come into the pits because he didn't get fuel, uh, but Bronner was, Clint Bronner, the chief mechanic, was just absolutely livid and later had... Um, I believe it was Floyd or one of the drivers just go run three, maybe Parnell, go run three laps to prove that that tire could, 
could have last. That's goof number two. Number three, we were talking about in 1969 when Lloyd Ruby had the race in command, somewhat mid-race, I think it was, and he comes in for a traditional pit stop. What happened on that, Bob? Well, he's, uh, really what happened, he let his foot slip off the clutch slightly and engaged the clutch, and it pulled away just before they had the fuel hose completely disconnected, which pulled out the side of the fuel, fuel tank. And uh, of course, you know, the pits were flooded with fuel at that point, and he was out of the race. And, and they, um, at, at that time, they, they fueled sometimes from the side of the car, rather the way we see it now. There were, right. there, those were when we had a lot more latitude in how the cars would be designed. Yep. And so that kind of locks in when they do it with that kind of refueling. Mm -hmm. And so you have to unlock it and pull it away. We don't do that, of course, in the current. We just we push it in, and it's not locked by anything. So bad, bad luck. Yeah. Goof, goof number four in 1995, and when they were ready to go green, Scott Goodyear jumps the pace car oh. and, uh, and goes around that. They immediately start throwing the black flag, and Goodyear... Uh, somewhat stubbornly refuses to uh, come into the pits with that. He actually wins the race because uh, Villeneuve, Villeneuve could not catch him, and they discounted those remaining 12 laps or so. But my opinion, the biggest goof up, number five, and I'll get you, uh, so Scott, don't feel so bad, it was in 2011, uh, on the final lap, on the final turn, this rookie by the name of uh, J.R. Hildebrand comes around and hits the wall and goes bouncing down, the, banging the, the outer wall down the track. And uh, Dan Weldon, who had not led a lap the entire race, passes him on the main straightaway to win his second Indy 500. So you have, you have uh, Bill Holland in 47, you had Saxon 61, you had Ruby in 69, you had Goodyear in 95, and then JR in 2011. Scott, uh, all of those, in my opinion, were bigger goofs than what just a, a mile an hour down the down the, the pit lane. But well, let's 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 analyze. What do you think? Let, let's chat one? about at least the last two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> were you were you recovering those Paul? I'm sorry. Were you covering either one of those? Uh, either tell. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, Holland, no. Let me think. No, I <laughs> normally. <laughs> um, uh, with regard to Scott Goodyear, he actually lost two Indy 500s by less than two seconds. I mean, <laughs> you talk about terrible, terrible huh. luck. And I'm with him all the time. Uh, in fact, we're going to lunch uh, next week. Um, he tells me that uh, after they they wanted that black flag out and uh, he and Steve Horn, the car owner, decided that they were not going to come in. They were going to prove that that engine in that day with that driver could drive 500 miles faster than anybody else. So it was a conscious decision made almost immediately. If they throw that flag, then uh, we're just going to keep going. And I, and I guess now... Uh, there is, in fact, a flag that tells you that you're going to be scored no longer. So, but uh, that was a conversation that was that was held there. Um, and in the um, the J.R. Hildebrand, I was in the broadcast booth st standing next to Mike King, who was then the anchor of the race. And I'm watching this, and it, it's funny because I'd had a conversation with Mike before the start of the race. Uh, it was just casual conversation, and part of what I was telling him was, remember that in the 500 especially, in the last laps, you've got to know the order like one through six, because you never know what's going to happen, and uh, on that day, that did happen. Cars fell out, and here comes J.R. Hildebrand around to win the Indianapolis 500. He's less than a thousand feet away, and he brushes the wall. And for a second, my brain is thinking, 
will he be able to slide across and take the win? And if he does slide across, will they count it as a win? Right. Which I'm sure they would have. But uh, the, uh, his, to his misfortune or his, his bad luck, um, here came uh, Dan Weldon just flying and he crossed and won. Um, but what Mike had done was he got caught up in the crash itself, which is exactly what we had discussed. And finally, he turns and looks at me because I'm kind of waiting for him, you know, to say something about the win. And he says, Paul, who won? <laughs> <laughs> so I felt so bad for Hildebrand and for Mike King. I, that, uh, that was a terrible thing to have happened to right, what, right. a really fine sports announcer. Uh, I write screenplays, amongst other things. And if one were to write an ending where the a rookie was leading on the last lap in the last turn and hits the wall and doesn't win, they would immediately not even consider that as just too unrealistic to, uh, uh, to even put on the screen and everything. Well, now, <laughs> wait a minute. There is a movie called Turbo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, uh, oh no, <laughs> not turbo. You got a plug in for your Eddie Sachs book. I'm getting a plug in for my movie. Oh, okay. there you go. Right. of course, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're going to segue out of this real quick, like, because, uh, two fun things happened this May. Uh, one was the honoring of Rick mirrors and where you hosted that Paul. Mm -hmm. And then also there was the uh, Hall of Fame banquet that the old timers put uh, tremendously done. Uh, you're one of the head people of that. Uh, Bob, why don't you tell the highlights of the, uh, of the uh, Hall of Fame banquet and its inductees, if you would. Right, right. Well, at the uh, Auto Racing Hall of Fame uh, and uh, Indianapolis 500 old timers banquet on the Thursday before the race, uh, one Paul Page uh, was inducted into that Hall of Fame. I think a very, very well-deserved honor. Uh, spoke very eloquently as we would expect that evening and uh, to the point of being, being emotional in parts of it, which was touching, touching to see. And, uh, you know, along with, uh, with Paul, uh, just to give you an idea of the people, the stature of the individuals that were inducted, you know, it was Wally Dollenbach and Danny Sullivan were inducted. And because of COVID, we had to go back a couple of years. So Paul was in this whole group with uh, Michael Schumacher, uh, Janet Guthrie, and uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr. So quite, quite a class there that Paul was a, a part of. And I think, a very, as I said, a very well-deserved honor. Appreciate that. You know, there's one quick little story. I tried to make, well, I didn't try. I made sure I was going to mention every one of my family members. Right. And um, anyway, my two grandchildren who live in, in Brooklyn, uh, one, the boy Finn, couldn't attend because of a COVID issue. But little Coco, who is six, could. And so I was talking about them and saying both of them want to be race drivers. And my only question is, who will be the first to win the Indy 500. And this little voice from my table, which is just down there, is Coco saying, I will. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, that was fun. She is so also fun. Uh, such an adorable little child. You have to be popping your buttons with pride. Oh, yeah. Her. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was funny when she said it. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and then they, the, the Rick Mears, an evening with Rick Mears, since mm -hmm. you, you did mention it, um, that was so much fun too, because it's just Rick and I, and, and, and Rick and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, we even uh, touched on what stories we couldn't talk about. <laughs> but, um, but you can talk about them on our uh, YouTube. No, podcast. no, no, I can't. No, <laughs> not even Nate's stories. Not Definitely even not the stories. <laughs> no. Um, but what I was especially impressed with was I asked him about his accident on, on Friday before he got, got on the pole and eventually won the race. Um, what that accident was like for him. Uh, he described, it probably took him five or six minutes to discharge that one answer. He uh. analyzed that thing all the way through. 
know that he sensed something was was happening in the back of the car uh, because that was what the the, the um, water hose had come loose and so that was spraying on the right rear and then he slams the wall hard and uh, gets upside down and and slides and slides and one of one of his lines was you know a race car does not slow down when it's upside down <laughs> <laughs> excuse me good line <laughs> that was fun that was fun i i was told that i didn't get i had another event to go to that night that uh, he had re-broken his foot. And you want to tell that story since you were, you were the host of it? Uh, I, I did not know that. that no, I, I, I most at that people time, didn't know that. At, them, I didn't at that time either. And uh, all I've heard is what you heard, uh, that he broke his foot in some way. But I haven't talked to him since that evening, so I don't know. But apparently he was using his other foot to... To, to drive. Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about during the crash. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking about that evening. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, he put one. Because that wasn't public knowledge, or at least I never knew yeah. that story. During that qualifying run, he uh, he put his left foot over on top of his throttle foot, so that he would not lift, not even a, a slight pause in lifting. And he had, when discussing qualifying runs before uh, talked and he talked that evening about the fact that you you even the tiniest lift kills your momentum it may not kill it kill it but it you know it could be the hundredth of a second that matters uh, as well as not not turning the front wheels much at all if you can get away with it because the minute you turn them you know they become a bit of a break so to make sure he didn't have a problem with just an accidental lift, uh, he put his one foot over the other for the run and <laughs> got the pole. <laughs> yeah, that, that event was quickly sold out. So uh, I would have liked to gone to and couldn't. Uh... Yeah, it was fun. They're going to do a lot more of those uh, later this year. So that'll yeah. be good too. Yeah, yeah, they're very nice. Well, there were two other crashes of note in the race uh the first being the person who very well could have won it uh ed carpenter's driver Francis bk uh, yeah. was running in probably i think second position he had led mm -hmm. he had led a lap and uh crashes moderately hard into the second turn ending his day uh, certainly has the makings of a future Indy 500 winner. Uh, oh, yeah. And he's let's a talk a little bit about VK. Uh, Paul, what's your take on him as a future winner and uh, what well, might have happened had he not crashed? Could he well, very well have been the... He would have been in the fight the whole time. Um, but uh, the wall tended, tends to end things like that. Um, he's a great guy. He's really wonderful to talk to. I uh, had dinner with uh, his uh, dad, Marjan, and himself and Larry Leindyke, uh one day. And uh, he was at the time, and, you know, just he's so exuberant about the Indianapolis 500 and how, you know, this, this is the best. And, and I, I, I wanted him to do better. I really did because he, yeah. and he will, we're going to see him on the podium, if not on the top of it several times this year. Yeah. Yeah. Now, on what was the first day of qualifying uh, on Saturday? Uh, VK was the fastest of all the qualifiers going into the fat. Now, what is the, now the fast 12 shootout on Sunday? Uh, so uh, did he get re-signed by Carpenter? Is he still? Uh, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. But he, he's good. I hope they don't lose him to F1. Uh, but a uh, real talented young kid amongst several young Indy car drivers such as Colton mm -hmm. Herta, Alex Pillow, uh, Pato Award, just it's a good crop. And then there's one that really didn't do all that well that they're extremely high on is Kyle Kirkwood. Yeah, uh, and it's rumored already to be heading to Andretti from Foyt. Well, he is, yeah. he will be at Andretti this weekend. Yeah. Oh. yeah. He'll be driving for Andre Andretti. And I think what's going to happen there, Bob, maybe you can help me with this, is Kirkwood will move to the the uh, Rossi car, the 27, yes. 
at the end of the year as Rossi right. goes over to McLaren. McLaren, right, yeah. And when Kirkwood joined uh, A.J. Foyt, I mean, it was already part of the plan that he would end up at Andretti. I think he'd been with Andretti most of his career, but right. he's really an outstanding, very outstanding talent. He really yeah. is. Part of that point is with him, uh, he was on loan to A.J. Foyt. Yes. Um, and now they're bringing him back into the Andretti fold. Now, I don't know what that means for A.J. Uh, in the future. Does he go back to Foyt at some point? That's a little up in the air in my mind. Right. But eventually right. you're going to see him absolutely driving within the <clears throat> under the, the uh, Andretti banner. Yeah, it should be interesting, Rossi, going to McLaren as well. I yes. think I think Rossi needed a breath of fresh air, so to yeah. speak. Sometimes a guy can be with a team, unlike Scott Dixon, who just keeps on going uh, with Ganassi. Sometimes a driver can be with a team too long yeah. and needs a breath of fresh air. Well, uh, Rossi, ran a, Rossi ran a very good race winding up fifth. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he really gave the illusion that he was charging harder than most of the – rest of the field and uh, I was halfway thinking he could still win this race but in the late stages so uh, but for McLaren that'd be a good move uh, Pato Award finished second Rosenquist Felix Rosenquist a close fourth I want to touch about this uh, Juan Pablo Montoya the two-time Indy 500 winner uh, was driving probably an identical car as those two he started 30th and he winds up finishing 11th, but in a very un Juan Pablo Montoya type of contend for the win type of a thing. Is this might be it if he can't uh, do better than that? Or you see uh, Montoya coming back and running more, perhaps as a fourth uh, McLaren driver next year. Well, what's your take on that, Bob? You see him returning or? I, I, I seem possibly returning. I'm not sure that it would be with McLaren. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a challenge for them to take on three cars full time, uh, much less four come May. But, but who knows? I mean, he put in a good run for them. Uh, but I think there are several teams that would probably want uh, Montoya, you know, as part of, mm -hmm. part of their team, you know, for the 500. It's actually not just Montoya, uh, still question marks about uh, Elio Castro Nevis, right. uh, TK. Yeah. You know, uh, I think they're, they're good for the 500 next year. No, right. look how they performed this year. Yeah. Um, and I'd hate to see either one, either of those walk away. Yes. But if I may be so bold, we kind of stepped away from Dixon's pit stop pretty quickly. And um, the official yeah, the official report, correct me if I'm wrong here, Bob, is that the rear wheels locked just as he was coming to the line and it didn't, so therefore he did not slow down. Is, is that what you've heard, Bob? Yes, I heard that same thing. And yeah. you can see it on the video where he did a little bit of mm -hmm. uh, fishtailing, yeah. you know, as he, as he climbed, on the, climbed on the brakes. Uh, there's, there's another thing I'd, I'd like to look at um, if, you, if you could find uh, such material is several of the drivers have in the past used a technique of running up to just before their pits and then turning off the limiter um, and they get a boost in speed more often than not it doesn't get caught but in in this case it it could have been that as well it, I mean anything mm -hmm. that gains you an advantage as oh, you come yeah. into that pit is and I, I, so I don't know. I don't know, but that kind of, right. I didn't think those rears locked all that much. And I'm not sure where the sensor is on the car. So yeah, exactly. Uh, I got a few trips to make. <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> well, and I think Rod, or, uh, Dixon was really, you know, had, the pressure was on him at that point because in the previous two pit stops with uh, Rosenquist and uh, uh, O'Ward, uh, O'Ward, I think, gained uh, maybe a second, second and a half, mm -hmm. and uh, Rosenquist gained almost two and a half seconds. 
And that wasn't because of pits, actual pit stop time. That was how they quickly, they were getting into the pits and out of the pits and back up the speed. So I think uh, Dixon has been criticized some for having so much experience. He shouldn't have done that, but I think he was feeling a little bit of pressure. Two seconds is a lot of time to make up on the track. Could well be, could very well be. So uh, what I'd like to do is start toward the back of the field and we'll look at the bottom 33 drivers and we'll comment on any of the ones you uh, think worth commenting on. Uh, Marco Andretti finished 22nd, uh, Sage Karam 23rd, Jack Harvey 24th in the Ray Hall car. This one surprised me, Kuma Sada, the two-time winner yeah. in 25th position. Uh, Kelton in 26, Wilson in 27, Jimmy Johnson 28, McLaughlin 29th, and Hurd the 30th. Uh, guys, we can kind of pick one to comment that any surprise of those stand out toward the back of the pack. I I uh, was surprised that Jimmy Johnson didn't do somewhat better than what he did Sunday. Um, as we know, the Ganassi cars were all strong. And I really believed and said it to many people that if he finished the race, which he didn't quite, but if he ran most of the day, he would have a strong finish. So I was a little bit surprised that he didn't uh, perform somewhat better. Um, Again, the cars were very, very tough to handle. And with wind and heat, they're in some tough weather conditions. But uh, that surprised me a little bit, not necessarily criticizing him but it just surprised me. Yeah, I, I thought he he was he, he was to a degree in the fight early on. He, he yes. certainly he certainly was pushing the car very well. Right. And I thought, you know, this could this could be a top 3 if not a win and oh my goodness, if it would have been a win, you know, what yes. would we be talking about right now? But uh, <laughs> he he showed showed for himself very well I thought until the accident. Right. Do you see based on his results there him coming back and running next year did he like it enough that he'll want to come back and try to get his face on the board warner queen or is just i done it now and uh at my age i'm not going to do it again uh, he, he, he said he would be back he said he couldn't wait to be back so yeah. um unless uh ganassi would drop him which i doubt Mm-hmm. Or his wife absolutely insists that he's not going to do it again, <laughs> which uh, I don't think that'll happen either. That seemed to seem like the entire family was just really caught up in the pageantry yeah. and the tradition and you know everything about the 500. And then uh, he was named Rookie of the Year for uh, this year's race, uh, causing some controversy on that end that he should not have been given that award. I was fine with him getting rookie yeah. of the year um, and, uh, and hope he does come back. All any of the other drivers of that group that uh, surprised you, disappointed you, oh, seen um, your expectations? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure any of those words specifically ap- apply, just kind of some, some disappointment with, with Marco because um, yeah. I thought throughout the month that he's there and he's going to be good and it it didn't work out but i thought how neat it would be if we finally get an andretti win at the track Mm -hmm. so but we didn't and and i i kind of i feel pretty badly for him because i thought he was very much available to the game but uh, it just didn't work out right a little fool's gold in that he was leading the race uh in the late stages more because of the recycling of the pit stops, but I guess had there been an extended, extended yellow that they didn't stop the race, he might have been able to pull a Rossi and 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 win it himself. Uh, uh, I thought uh, as quick as Takuma Sato was all week, uh, one that he uh, kind of disappointed on his qualifying efforts, but in the race uh, he. Uh, didn't advance as fast as the Kumasato can oftentimes do. That was my, of that group. Uh, of course, obviously, Herta was 
lot of people's pre-race picks before the accident and everything. Yeah. But um, also, McLaughlin uh, ran fairly well and then got caught up yeah. in a minor crash. Uh, none of the Pensy cars uh, had a particularly strong day. No. Which so that, just, that was surprising, if, if not yeah. shocking. I, I expected the Penske cars because I thought the Chevrolet was the strongest, strongest engine yeah. out there. Um, and it didn't turn out that way, did it? And that, uh, you know, you, to have Penske that far down, uh, I, I can probably guarantee you that there's a lot of very heavy work being done in that shop <laughs> yeah. right now. Well, Will Power was very strong at the beginning. Then he you mentioned yes, he Jimmy was. Johnson, very strong. Um, he moved up fairly quickly, and then all of a sudden he started going backwards, and I guess the car was loose, and they just really couldn't do anything with it. Although uh, I did hear him say that he was, uh, considering all, he was happy with 15th. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's something to hear a Penske <laughs> driver say as well, isn't it? Yeah. I'm happy with 15th. <laughs> the, yeah, that, the that may also get a conversation <laughs> from the used to be yeah. two, team owner RP. <laughs> right, exactly. But for a typical Penske paint job, that was a total uh, opposite direction, which you normally say almost looks like the days of Benetton in Formula One with the <laughs> purple on it and and goldenrod yellow on it and black and red and everything. Uh, well, there was there were some beautiful cars and, and and we've seen some of them since the start of the season, but there were some magnificently uh, designed on, on the uh, the mylar wrap that they use. I just mm -hmm. there were some magnificent looking cars. Right, right. As far as a patriotic look, I don't think anyone can top J.R. Hildebrand's uh, stars and stripes, yeah. red, yeah. white, and blue, and the way they painted it. Well, then the next group, uh, 20 through 29, we or, or 11 through 20, I guess would be, uh, Montoya was 11th, uh, Hildebrand 12th, uh, Newgarden 13th, Ray Hall 14th, Power 15th, Maluka 16th, Kirkwood 17th, Carpenter 18th, uh, D. Francesco, 19th, and the young Danish driver, Lungard, 20th. Uh, comments on any of those, whether they exceeded, did what you kind of thought or disappointed of, of any of those, that groupings? I, I think, uh, I think Hildebrand, you know, really did an excellent job. Um, where did he start? 17th, I think, something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but to finish 12th and, and won a points car, and they just in the last years, they have not had uh, very competitive cars. But between his driving, evidently, and, and the pit stops and uh, getting the yellows right, he ended up in 12th place. So I thought that surprised me, to be quite honest, that he any point car finished that high. I'll probably get beat up about saying that, but... <laughs> <laughs> or, at least, or at least your neck grabbed or something. <laughs> yes. um, I don't know. I uh, With his two wins this year, I thought Newgarden came in as a, a strong likelihood of winning this year's race. And uh, not a not a good day at all for him. Uh, uh, I don't think he really even ran in the top 10 other than through uh, uh, pit, pit changes and everything. So that was my take on Disappointing. Also, I guess how uh, weak all three Ray Hall's uh, cars ran. Uh, last year, Graham Ray Hall didn't qualify particularly quick, but he quickly moved up in the ranks and uh, threatened to possibly win last year's race before he got caught right. in an accident, but not at all. And uh, I think. Uh, Jack Harvey's probably questioning why he made this move. Uh, uh, but um. well, I there, and I can't point to a single moment that I thought he was good. But I just have a feeling that Malukas is going to be somebody we need to keep an eye on too. Yeah. I, he's got a lot of racing moxie there, and and he's fast. He's really fast. In a in a coin car, also in a couple of the test sessions, he he out sped the all the other rookies and everything right. so that, yeah. i guess that really didn't surprise and he also was involved in a carb day test 
as right. well, uh, crash as well. Was that his backup he was running also? I think it might have been. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if that was a backup or they got his car repaired. He did but, not have as much damage as uh, oh, Colton no. Harder did, <clears throat> but uh, excuse me, he, but, he did a he did a very good job. Uh, yeah, and the highest finishing rookie of the entire class. Right. Um, Which in, the, in, a, in normal years, um, he would have been the rookie of the year. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the final thought was the disappointment Ed Carpenter must have had to have his car not restart. I was going to ask this question as it unfolded. Since it was yellow and when he did get his car restarted, could he have motored around to what was his spot in line? He didn't, so I guess probably couldn't. But at that time, I was thinking, could he do that under the yellow to get back to his assigned position when they red flagged the race? One would think so, but yeah, uh, again, happen, I, 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 I give up on trying to interpret rules. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm always wrong. I, I assumed he could get back in his position, but then I heard, uh, heard it said that he had to go to the back of the line. So I'm like, I'm like Paul. I'm not quite sure about the rules anymore. Even, even with Colton Herta having his car replaced the car, normally that would send you to the back. The, yeah. the 33rd starting position. Right. They've they changed that rule now. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so that brings us now rules. to the top 10. Uh, we'll go backwards. Santino Ferrucci finished 10th. His streak of top 10 finishes continues. He was running even stronger than that through most of the race. He was running uh, fifth through a lot of it. I yeah. think his brand went up running that strong in a dryer, in a and drive a rainbow car. Uh, comments about Santino on from either one of you? Uh, he, he needs to have a full time ride. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess he will place uh, replace Illot this weekend in Detroit. Oh, okay. Um, Illot uh, wasn't not released medically after his crash. I don't, I don't know what the problem was. I think but, he broke a wrist, I believe. The, yeah, the probably so. Said. Uh, because he he had his wrist wrapped after the race, but uh, Ferrucci is will get a shot, you know, in that car. But he's just one of those guys. I'm not sure why he doesn't have a full time ride. Mm -hmm. he, he does, especially here at Indy, he does an excellent job. And he has the uh, the color that and charisma Indy car you would think would <laughs> like. You know, uh, as as pot. Well, let's put a quick shout in for the Snake Pit which was 25,000 strong, at least this year. Uh, Ferrucci would fit in quite well, I think. If they, <laughs> yes. they took him down the stake, but probably better than any other no. driver in the, in the starting <laughs> field. Him and Connor Daly would be. Uh, a <laughs> uh, ninth, and this guy very easily could have won Alex Pelot. Uh, started second. Uh, was alternating with Dixon uh, back and forth in the early stages, probably because it was a way of both of them saving some fuel with the other uh, in the lead. But uh, he had a misfortune in uh, as he was going to make a pit stop. Paul, you want to comment about what happened? On well, he, he was he was running out of fuel. He was going to make a pit stop and got got caught with a yellow and couldn't make the stop and uh, had to drive i i it's it's another rule that i i don't entirely understand yeah. but i guess it's a fair rule and that that put him in the back and he couldn't fight his way out of that yeah but he did soldier up to finish ninth uh just impressive run i i think it just showed how yeah. talented he is you know when you look again at Herta and VK and Pelo, uh, there there's so much talent there. And yeah. Ward as well. Uh, eighth place uh, and seventh place were the Meyer Shank uh, combinations. Uh, Simon Pagano finished eighth, who and Elio Castroneves going for his fifth win finished seventh. Throughout the day, basically Pagano was running ahead of uh, Castroneves. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that Elio caught him at the end. Uh, what do you think for the Meyer Shank? Were they a little disappointed in this year's performance? I, I think they almost have to be. 
they really weren't in contention for a win. What's your take on that, Bob? Well, a lot of the teams, a lot of the cars, Andretti really was one. We talked about Penske, just did not have the pace uh, that some of the, uh, especially Ganassi had. And uh, I think uh, Castro Neves and, and Pagano both made some, made excellent progress through mm -hmm. the field yeah. and evidently good strategy to finish where they did, but they just didn't quite have the pace, the speed uh, to get all the way to the front. Yeah, but I think that Meyer Shank uh, definitely has proven that they are a team to be yes. con contended with. They're, they're moving up. Yeah, and, and that was an excellent finish to have both cars mm -hmm. finish mm -hmm. that high after starting that far back. Mm -hmm. Well, that the qualification, uh, their speeds really cost them potentially. They were a fast nine or fast 12 shootout type team. It might have been entirely different. Castro Nevis would have certainly ran probably a different race. So do you think next year the drive for five will have near the the emphasis like it was this year? If Castro Nevis, I'm sure. Yeah, well, for me, <laughs> <laughs> I want Elio to win that one. <laughs> I know this does not come across well, but I want to show this if, and uh, excuse our viewers if it if it's a blip, bit blurry. But I think I've been collecting Indy 500 programs since uh, Tony Holman bought the track in 46. I got every one of those. I think this is the neatest cover that they've ever done as they honored Castro Nevis and his four wins with the things. It's just a fantastic cover from my perspective. Uh -huh. I hope he comes back and, and, and maybe gets his fifth uh, and climbs the pagoda. Yeah, and maybe gets one of those balloons <laughs> that gets stuck on it or something. Uh, yeah, who really knows? Awesome. Who knows what he'll do if he wins five? <laughs> it should be a show within itself. Yep. And last year, uh, Connor Daly looked like a potential winner. He looked good again this year. Oh, he uh, really led, looked good. Legitimately yeah. led a uh, portion of the race. Uh, slid down to sixth place in the end. Uh, does he have to worry about job security next year, or do you think this helps cement him with Carpenter full time next year? I one I really like Connor. Um, yeah. His dad Derek and I worked together. We're, we're still great friends. Um, I remember when Connor was born, um, and I I think he has it. Um, yeah. He's for some reason not always right totally there not not talking about him but um he catches some bad breaks and uh he's he's a guy that we should not discount oh i definitely see him yeah. as an indy 500 winner yeah. uh in the jill de Ferran type of mode uh, mm -hmm. uh i don't see him necessarily as a multi-time winner but uh hope he doesn't strangle me like uh <laughs> like Floyd. but no but i, I definitely i think hunter Daly yeah. is, uh, could easily I, win Indy. I uh, think he needs uh, to be with one team for a while. You know, he's yeah. jumped around from team to team, and maybe he'll be able to stay with Ed Carpenter. Mm -hmm. And Carpenter always has strong teams, strong cars for Indy. Yeah, particularly at Indy, yeah. With, yeah. And with uh, I still probably VK will be the quicker of the two uh, just because he's that talented. But fifth place we alluded to, uh, Rossi. Mm -hmm. uh, the highest finish in Andretti car. Uh, he goes to McLaren next year. Uh, right. That could be his second win uh, with that team and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, real talented. Felix Rosenquist finished fourth. He had the, he was kind of on the hot seat for a bit. I think his showing uh, on race day uh, kind of bought him another year. Uh, and uh, almost, you could almost say he was in the hunt for the win too. In a, yeah. oh yeah, I don't think he was as quite as strong as award, but to be that close at the end, anything could happen. And, right. Uh, you know, I guess award could have taken out both he and Erickson <laughs> and uh, TK and uh, or Rosenquist could have very well won it. Uh, 
Yeah. So uh, Award was smart. <laughs> yeah, he was. He, he was smart. Well, he just signed that contract with McLaren, so he was yeah. probably thinking, hey, I'm in this for the long haul. Let's not yeah. do something <laughs> it's too stupid here. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, and again, uh, congratulations to uh, Erickson. He ran a strong month, a strong, strong win. Have, has anyone ever tried Husky? He says he's going to bring some of that over to sample everyone uh, next year. So, uh, from what I understand, I've never tried it. What, what I understand is excellent, but the supply chain issues we're dealing with in COVID has mm -hmm. prevented it getting here. So, mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully they'll get some here. Yeah. Use your okay. Hall of Fame status to get us some next May, uh, <laughs> Paul, if you will, which brings us to up to the last point of this show, looking ahead to uh, 2023 uh, and plans, no doubt, uh, are starting to be laid. Uh, most of the teams return existing drivers. Do you, do you see uh, um, the win by Erickson causing other F1 drivers to think, hmm, uh, if, a, if a marginal F1 driver can come over and win Indy, uh, I can win it too. And I did hear, did hear Verstappen saying he will, will not do it and Perez as well. But uh, do you see other F1 uh, drivers coming over now to try to do that? I don't know. The car count is it's not favorable to do that. But uh, looking ahead, what do you see for 2023, uh, Bob? You, you, you play Ouija and you know, Got an eight ball and everything. <laughs> who, was, who was that for, me or Paul? Uh, well, since it's you. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see more of the things, uh, uh, more of the same for next year. If we're just speaking of the five hundred, and and I I anticipate being more cars uh, than this year. I don't think they'll be struggling for the thirty three, um, but some of the same drivers, you know, Erickson and uh, certainly Award and. And Colton Herta, uh, you know, I'm not sure when he's going to go to F1. I think it's inevitable that he goes. I'd like to see him win the 500 first. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is testing for McLaren, which I kind of wondered about that, why they didn't have uh, a war doing that rather than mm -hmm. Herta. So uh, there might be some politics and some interesting things that play there. Politics and racing? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Paul. As you look ahead to next year, what do you what do you see in some of the? Well, um, first of all, with regard to your Formula One comment, um, either one of the Haas drivers, uh, um, Schumacher or Magnussen, I, I, you know, they they they've gotten a little further up, but uh, I, I don't. They, I, I think if anybody would do it, they would be the ones. But I don't yeah. see that happening at all. I don't see uh, anybody making a big move out of Formula One to come to Indy at this moment. With regard to Indy itself specifically next year, um, as I, I think we said before we really got going on the Indy 500, but one of the things we talked about a couple of weeks ago was the, um, the fact that these, these younger drivers are taking over. Um, they didn't take completely over because the veterans showed themselves pretty well in this race. But there's still no doubt that uh, there are some extraordinarily fast uh, young drivers who uh, yeah. are not only going to win a lot, they're going to keep winning a lot for some time. Well, right. I, I definitely see Penske being a lot stronger next year. McLaughlin, how he ran at Texas, could very yeah. well be a future winner. Well, we had a question of the week last week. Uh, what was your favorite Indy 500 and why? Uh, Rosemary from Lawndale, California writes, my absolute, and then you'll like this, Paul Page, <laughs> my absolute favorite Indianapolis 500 was in 1977 <laughs> when A.J. Foyt became the first four-time winner and Janet Guthrie became the first woman to drive in the 500. But please settle this argument or my husband says women were not allowed in the pits. Who's right? Oh, they were, they were definitely allowed in the pits at that time. Uh, right. I think it was maybe 70 when that 
finally took hold a, a local um, local reporter, a gal named Marianne Butters, uh, and a couple of other ladies had uh, uh, filed a suit. And uh, I, I think that there was, you know, the, the suit never got truly heard because it, it they they realized this, this is something that's happening. And um, that was an old superstitious thing at the Speedway. And so, you know, finally that went away and, and thank goodness it did. You know, I, yeah. uh, one of the first women I can remember seeing is, is, was Betty Rutherford up there timing on the scoring stand for her husband. And, uh, you know, you, there's, you've got a number or well, at least several uh, women who are working in the pits now um and then you have a lot of them just working just involved engineer uh, uh fabricators everything so uh -huh. it, it, it's it's just normal now which is the way it should have always been right well, we, we yeah. thank everyone and again for comments or yeah. whatever you might want to ask of bob or paul or myself go to in the no speedway insiders at gmail.com that's speedwayinsiders at gmail.com uh, we have a big weekend coming up in detroit on bell isle we'll be covering that uh next weekend so it, it was a it was a very interesting race I yeah, I, i've got i i've got uh, not to interrupt you which of course is what i'm doing um i have another question for both of you along the same lines um what turn at the speedway is the toughest turn. Well, someone would probably say turn two this past uh, race mm -hmm. is more accident. I guess typically it's regarded as turn one. That's what I uh, uh, more because of the grandstand effect and going in. Uh, I, you, you probably have your answer. What would it be for <laughs> Mr. <Faye? laughs> Traditionally, it's been turn one. But I've heard more people talk, uh, more drivers talk about turn three being tougher now uh, than than what it had or what they thought it had been in the past. So uh, if you look at the accidents, of course, turn two must be the toughest. <laughs> That's where most of the accidents happened this year. That's why they built the suite there, I guess, so, <laughs> yeah, to give everyone a let but anyway, me. it was a great race. I'm sorry for yeah. Scott. It's well, I, mean, I got the, I got an answer here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. At the well, fastest rookie luncheon, yeah. um, most of the rookies said turn two is by far the most difficult, having to do in part with the, you know, you're shaded a little bit from the wind going into one, but you're really kind of wide open in turn two. So I, and that surprised me because I'd always thought turn yeah, one. Yeah, that's a good, good point. Can I add one thing very quickly here? If I don't get criticized for going too long on this. All right. No, this will take no, a minute. Go over. with it. Uh, on social media, as can be expected, there was a many observations, if you will, opinions about the race coverage uh, this year, particularly the TV coverage. And I won't go into those details, but what I found interesting, and this goes along, I think, very well with Paul being inducted into the Hall of Fame, is that comment after comment after comment said, I wish Paul Page was doing it. I wish Paul Page was yeah. back. So I think that says a lot about Paul and his legacy. Oh, and, and I saw some of those, too. That's, that's, that's always very kind. But uh, no, I don't have it anymore. So. <laughs> Well, you, you do an excellent job, uh, even in the old timers barbecue. Uh, yeah. uh, one last co quick comment. Uh, uh, our dear friend, Buddy Urbanski, won the Tom Carnegie Award at the old timers thing. And a, uh, very befitting of, of him to win it. So yes, shout out for Buddy. Uh, and he, with a wink and a nod and a $20 bill, you can almost get any one of your <laughs> friends into the old timers. He's that nice a guy <laughs> and cordial to everyone that, that comes in. So, uh, so keep your comments coming. We love you. Thank you also for everyone who has such favorable opinions. I got a lot of that. I, I think, Bob, you said you had people coming up. And Paul, you had people coming up and liking uh, how these are going. So we thank you for that. Uh, we'll be back next week to cover Detroit and also more uh, 
uh, Indy 500 nostalgia from those good old yesteryear days. And uh, with this, uh, we wish you all Godspeed from Paul Page, Bob Gates. This is Denny Miller saying see you next week. God bless.